Today we're going to start off with um, a bit of a discussion, a backgrounder on Louis Riel in recognition of Louis Riel Day here and, uh, and the Métis Nation. Russell, if you would like to start. Sorry, I was just talking to Irma there. Yeah, I'm not sure what the issue is. She, um, she can't see us, she can hear us, but obviously we can't hear her. So uh, I think she'll just jump in whenever she can, she can get it figured out. But Okay, that's um, it. Yeah, so Tan Chiki, well, Russell Fant, Nishina Kaushon, I will have and Metro the cold son Tepnia, I go in Kishita Munla Michifa Wian. So, uh, good afternoon, I guess it is now, everybody. My name is Russell Fant, and uh, I am an instructor with the Suntep Regina program. Uh, also, graduate of the program, and uh, at Suntep, I teach Metis history and Metis culture. And so, I do want to thank Emily. Uh, for organizing this and for all the people that helped out to get it together and um, and for for Irma's prayer <laughs> which I'm sure we'll get eventually but um, so I'm looking around the, the zoom room and I see lots of very familiar faces and so I'm, I'm not going to give you a, a super extensive version of who Riel is I'm, I'm sure most of you know the story uh, so I'll just give you a brief review, and then if um, people have questions during the question period, we can address some of those. So um, Riel is the son of Julie Elijah Modier and Louis Riel Sr., and I think that is significant for a couple reasons. And when we look at uh, why Riel became such an advocate for his people, and of course he's known as one of the most well-known leaders of the Métis Nation, um, he really grew up with, with two really strong narratives of advo advocacy, uh, one being from his mother's side, and she was descended from um, the first Western pioneers, I guess, that came west of Ontario. Um, and his father, who was instrumental in helping to break the Hudson's Bay Monopoly. And so um, as the eldest child in that family, Louis Riel grew up with lots of stories of, of helping his people, and that really helped to shape who he is. Um, he is the leader of two armed Indigenous resistances in Canada's history, one in 1869-70, which resulted in the creation of Manitoba, and of course um, the last Métis resistance, which was in 1885, which occurred in Batoche, and which of course resulted in his hanging on this day in 1885. He is known as the founder of Manitoba. He's an early advocate for human rights, and he's actually one of the very first people to bring up this idea of Western alienation. Because when we get into the era of 1885, Riel isn't just uh, fighting for and representing uh, Métis concerns. He's been approached by various groups of people, including white settlers of Prince Albert or North Battleford, who are feeling very disenfranchised in the 1880s. And of course, um, some members of the First Nations community who also had been uh, experiencing a lot of hardship due to treaty obligations not being fulfilled um, and, and that has many reasons that, that I won't go into here but further to that he he was a poet he wrote lots of beautiful poems in, in his life almost exclusively in French he was a teacher for a time in Montana he was a politician that helped to secure voting rights for many of the Métis citizens in in Montana and as well as the Dakotas he was a community organizer uh, par excellence, and we see many examples of that both in Red River and in Batoche. And I guess, um, you know, not, not um, to minimize the importance of, of family, he was a father, and he was an uncle, and he was a son, and he was a brother, and he was a friend. He came from a very large Métis family, and there are many descendants of the Rails that are still around today. Uh, of course, he himself does not have direct descendants because none of his children live to have children of their own, sadly. And lastly, I guess I would just say that um, I fundamentally believe that the Métis people themselves are a living treaty. We are the result of uh, the first iteration of reconciliation in this country. And we, we were born out of a promise between Indigenous and non-Indigenous peoples to work together and to help understand one another. And so if we understand Métis people to be that living treaty, then I think we can also extend that understanding to say that Riel was really the treaty commissioner in that context, in the sense that he worked together to help our two disparate communities understand one another and to understand each other's issues um, specifically. So why do we celebrate Riel Day? Um, I guess celebrate is, is probably the wrong word because, of course, we hold this day of remembrance 
on the day of his hanging. And so, um, you know, I was, I was saying to somebody earlier that um, when you look at, say, for example, when Americans celebrate Martin Luther King Jr. Day, uh, it, it's on his birthday, and it's a day to really celebrate, you know, some of his accomplishments. And of course, we celebrate Riel's accomplishments on this day. But I think also this is a day for us to remember, um, you know, the, the heaviness of this day, that his death was, was not a kind death, um, that it was the result of, of um, he and the Métis people being ignored for years and years and years. And that um, for decades after the 1885 resistance, the Métis people continued to be ignored to the extent that many people thought that we no longer existed. I think it's important that we recognize that we don't have any national celebrations of Indigenous leaders in this country in the same sense that we, we have them for, for non-Indigenous leaders or for colonial leadership. And so I think that's significant that across Canada we can look to the state and say this was a significant Indigenous leader who did uh, significant things for the Métis community. I think it's also important on this day to recognize Riel's contributions to Canada. Um, we have many different stories across this dominion on how provinces were begun and I think that the story of how Manitoba was founded is, is, is one of the most significant stories because it was conducted mostly by Indigenous people, by the Métis people of Manitoba. And I think lastly, why we hold this day is, is to remember the man and his contributions, but also to remember the community that helped to bring those, those, those visions for uh, Métis nationhood to life. Riel, at the end of the day, as is, is much as many people want to see him as a martyr or as a savior, at the end of the day, he was a human and he was a man and he had weaknesses and faults like everybody else. But I think it's, it's undeniable um, that a person who helps to found a province at the age of 25 years old, a person who lived in exile for 15 years of his life and still managed to create a happy home for his wife and his children, a person who experienced what we would call today mental illness and still had these massive achievements. Uh, I think that that is significant reason enough for us to say that today's a day that's important for us to remember all that Louis Rail accomplished. I'll leave it at that. Thank you so much for that, Russ. And we have good news. So uh, Brenna and Irma are on the line together. And so Irma is going to share the opening prayer um, via Brenna's telephone. So please go ahead. Oh, thank you. I'm so sorry for all of this, people. Uh, I'm going to start with the opening prayer and then I'm going to do a little story about me. Um, as always, I'm honored to be asked to pray for blessings. I don't expect anybody to be standing up. If you're not Roman Catholic, you can pray in your own way. Bonjour. Chica hasta o malejour. Kanawap minan ka mamao piyakota. Marci de tuanan e wichi hiyak. Chinishta stamak kanekika na kishkato pikishkoyak anosh. Wichi hinan pare chite stamak. Ekwa koyesh chipimoteyak. Madon can away menan to leisure, Kayalin Kaya Chemoshakin Yak the Covid. So that was an opening and a closing, and uh, I, I think everybody gets the drift of what it was. I'm sure I'm sure Russell remembers what what uh, everything that I said, but it, it's it, it's just a, a blessing for the day. Uh, and to and to keep us writing, uh, walking on the same path, and and thinking thinking minds alike, those kinds of things. Uh, thanking him for helping us um, as we're gathered here in different places to talk about what what we're talking about today, and to understand why we're here. And um, and uh, please uh, help us not to catch the COVID. <laughs> so that was that was that. Okay, now. My story's not very long because I know I don't have much time. Um, I don't know if there are any Mitchup speakers out there, but it, it doesn't really matter because I didn't do it in Mitchup. I just wanted to say that in the valley where I came from, born, of course, in the first half of the last century, um, everybody spoke Mitchup, and we were called half-breeds back then. I never heard the word Métis until I was quite old. Um, so, uh, education was very important, though, to Michif people, even though they weren't allowed to go to school. 
they were never allowed to go to school because, until after 1944, and, and we were still living in the valley at that time, and there were no, no closed schools that were public schools. There were schools that, that people had just uh, made up, but they wouldn't take anybody except their own families and those kinds of things. They were like farmers' children and stuff. Um, I, I, but when, we, when they finally got to go to the other schools, they weren't really allowed there, so they called themselves French, or the schools would take them in um, and, and call them French or any other nationality, but they wouldn't, uh, they wouldn't call them Michis because they weren't allowed to do that. So no one in my immediate family could read or write. And that was because Lee Michi, for the half-breeds, were not allowed to go to school. We went through that already, and I'm, I'll go through it every bloody day. <laughs> I remember my mother standing up, carrying a, a sign, big signs, and of course she couldn't read it. But but somebody said to her, "Year, we need a we need a school. Hold, hold this sign." And so she's walking along, and there were lots of Michi families living on the Kepper Road lounge when I was born. They say, you know, all things happen for a reason, and I truly believe that. My grandfather and his brother, Joe, and my aunt all got tuberculosis, and so we all had to move to Fort Capel so we could be close to them because they were in the sanatorium. And um, anyway, that was in the early 50s. And the miracle cure also happened like not that long after that, and so they could all go home. But as a result of all of that, I got to go to town school. Never having ever seen a school, I was very intimidated, and there were lots of, there, I have lots of stories about school, but I'm not going to go there. Um, but the only thing that happened was that some of school officials came to the house and told my mom and grandma and grandpa and everybody that we had to speak English at our house because, uh, you know, this girl had to go to school. Okay, so I'm going to get on with the story faster. When we moved to the fort, we moved into a neighborhood that had lots of Michis living there. And one of the girls who was a few years older than me taught me to print my name and write my name. No one had ever seen my name written anywhere, so she spelled it as she thought it was. I was very proud to write my name, Irma Klein, E-R-M-A, and, and, uh, because I was the only one in the family who could do it. Lots of things happened in school that didn't make any sense to me, never having ever been in any kind of uh, environment. But to make a very long story short, I went through my entire life with that name. Went to school, got my social insurance card, I worked, I got married, my driver's license, absolutely everything under Irma Taylor with an E. When I got to be 65 and applied for my OAS and CPP, they said I didn't exist. And uh, would I just hand them $137 and they'll change my E to an I. So I said, uh, what is my other alternative? And they said, well, you go back to your birth name and you can do that for free. I said, well, sounds good to me. So that's what happened. And this is what happens when nobody can read or write in your family <laughs> before you go to school. And whose fault is that? The damn government. Oh, I didn't say that out loud. Okay. I have many anecdotes of my growing up life, but today is not today. I'm leaving the experts to do Louis Riel. Okay, bye, hon. Okay. Thank you both to Brenna and Irma. Um, Irma, that story, I've heard it before several times. It's fantastic. It never fails to entertain and also deliver a really important message, obviously, around um, what it means to live in colonial Canada as an Indigenous person. Um, so again, thank you, Irma. And with that, um, let's turn back to our panel. Uh, so the first question of our panel goes to Jessica, who's going to speak to Métis activism within the broader movement of Indigenous re resistance. And our question to her is, today the term Indigenous is often used in ways that diminish the diversity and distinctions amongst Indigenous peoples in Canada. What does Métis activism look like within the broader movement of Indigenous research or resistance? Okay. Uh, hi, everybody. Uh, my name is Jessica. Um, I'm a second year SunTEP student, uh, third year university student. My first year I uh, went through GDC. I was in political science. Um, so this activism question definitely spoke to me having gone through that part of university and then also just always uh, feeling quite politically inclined myself, which as I've gone through SunTap, I've learned is a uh, very Métis quality. Um, so the term, first of all, the term Indigenous um, and terms like that, 
do tend to kind of diminish our individuality, um, which I think is interesting because the term Indigenous or um, the term by POC, which is the Black Indigenous People of Color, are generally born from us wanting to talk about ourselves in a way that feels more inclusive, um, but quickly is taken by settler and colonial culture and used to how, how they want to use it. Almost as soon as it's out of our mouths, they have taken it and made it into something else that somehow has become kind of harmful. Um, so I do think that Métis activism is, has always been quite present and has always been a force throughout um, Indigenous history in Canada. And I think it's really important to have our own um, distinction. I think it's important for any group that isn't that dominant, um, like white cis male, to be active, to have a strong activism, um, like value within their uh, culture and community. So I feel Métis, uh, you know, within this little Indigenous group, we have Métis, Inuit, and First Nations. And our Typically in Canada, the, the focus is put on First Nations issues and not to take away from them, but we as Métis people, our history of oppression and the things that we have gone through have been, they have been different from First Nations people. We have our own forms of oppression that we've been privy to and our own challenges that we've um, had to go through. So I... I feel as though those terms kind of strip us of the inclusivity and it, it puts us all together. Um, so I think modern activism as a Métis person, I think our biggest hurdle that we have right now is just kind of um, legitimizing ourselves to the government and then to the, the like society as a whole. Um, it is kind of a bitter pill to swallow, but we they don't recognize us right now and as russell said we are easily forgotten or looked over and passed over and we really do have to fight to just be taken seriously and to be seen as a real um a real culture which again is a difficult thing to you know try to to conceptualize the fact that we have to convince the government to acknowledge us it is difficult but that recognition and being a loud voice in the room prevents us from being lost or fading away. Um, as you can see, like in our Western culture, the, the refusal to understand us has kind of uh, resulted in a lot of, you know, oppression and infringing on our rights. If you go to Eastern Métis culture, they've even gone a step further in, you know, kind of bastardizing our rights and really just stealing stealing from us. Um, I thought of a good like um, example of that is Rachel Dozel. She was an American woman who pretended to be Black in order, order to work at the NAACP. And that story of this singular woman pretending to be this other ethnicity, um, ethnicity made international headlines. Whereas in Eastern Canada, there are thousands upon thousands of people doing the exact same thing with Métis rights, and it, it's not acknowledged, it's, it's commonplace. And I think that's a unique struggle to Métis people in Canada. I think that's a big part of the reason why we need to, you know, dis, uh, distinguish ourselves and just kind of work as um, making ourselves, you know, known apart from our First Nations cousins. In the same breath, I feel like having that distinction will kind of reduce infighting. I feel like they're, because we are all grouped together, um, the fight for our rights um, kind of can get muddled in between, you know, who, everybody wants from the same pot and it's hard when we're all kind of mixed together. So I feel like us having our own distinction from First Nations people and Inuit people can also, can help us work together to bring us all up. Uh, I think a good example of that is like in the 60s and 70s, the, you know, Black Panther organizations and AIM, they were quite separate and they were fighting for similar things, um, and, but they did still work together while having their separate entities. And I think that's a, a good way for us to model how we go forward. Um, so yeah, basically for me, like my personal thoughts on Métis activism are 
that being involved in organizations is incredibly important right now. Like um, there are several Métis organizations in the province and to be at the ground floor of these is kind of the only way to understand how they work and the way they've worked in the past and what we need to do to continue bringing our nation forward. And in terms of being, you know, separate from the Indigenous blanket, we, we really need to fight for ourselves harder than anybody else would because, you know, we can't expect others to fight harder for us than we are willing to do for ourselves. So those are my thoughts on Métis activism and yeah, I'll leave it there. Thank you so much, Jessica. That was fantastic. Um, so now we're going to turn to Sherry, who's going to discuss representations of Riel. Um, and so our question to Sherry is, the claiming of Métis identity through the appropriation of Métis symbols, such as the flag and Riel himself, uh, Métis identity, like any racial or cultural identity, can shift over time. Please discuss the claiming of Métis identity through the appropriation of Métis symbols, such as the flag and Riel. Turn your mic off, girl. Um, I guess it does change over time. My family, so I'm, I'm in this, I'm in an interesting kind of currently off the map uh, in terms of legally recognized or, or organizationally recognized uh, as Métis, and I also have status. Um, but I always like to remind myself and other people that these are external, external categories that have been imposed upon us. Um, part of my family originates from James Bay and Hudson Bay, and a really significant portion of the population who ended up in Red River actually originated along the bay. And so some people moved west and some people didn't. But we were actually pretty interested. So I've found mission records and uh, some in the Catholic records that through the Catholic Church and through the priests, the people like my ancestors, like not that long ago, were hearing about Riel. They were really interested in everything that was happening out West. And people still have those stories because they were very concerned and interested and also had relatives that were involved. And sometimes this information was exchanged uh, by letters. Um, but we're talking of very, really comparatively small populations that really don't have anything to do with all the people that are appropriating uh, Métis imagery in really inappropriate ways. It's almost like there's two separate things. And the people that get forgotten in all of this, Kufra, are the small populations of people in Northern Ontario, Northern Quebec, and the little pockets in Southern Ontario, uh, like around Sault Ste. Marie, who's, who definitely have uh, Métis roots and still, I, and still have the stories. But I was lucky in that I was born and raised in Manitoba and actually grew up across the street from Louis Riel's great nephew. And growing up in Manitoba, I mean, this will sound facetious, but you, you can't throw a stick without hitting someone who's related to Riel. Uh, he had sisters, his sisters uh, married, and many of their children ended up living around uh, Lake Winnipeg, sort of in the post-resistance movement where people fled Red River and just stepped outside of the postage stamp province and turned uh, fishing camps into permanent communities. And this is where I, I grew up. And so my first stories that I heard of Riel were from his great nephews and nieces. And so he was a very living person to me. I grew up hearing those stories. And then one of the first ones that I heard was from his great niece. And I was squished in the back of a car going to Winnipeg. And for some reason, this someone's grandma started telling us a story about Riel. And I, I remember it so vividly. And there's actually a number of people that I've talked to from Manitoba who this was their first story too. And that was the chain. When the surveyors come and lay the chain down and he put his foot on the chain. And so I have this very vivid memory based on the description that like I knew his foot was in a moccasin like his moccasin foot went on the chain. And so for a lot of kids growing up hearing those stories, that was our first image sort of in story was this moccasin foot, this young guy, you know, changing history with one gesture. 
of saying no. But Riel the man <clears throat> is often forgotten in Riel the symbol because Riel has become a symbol and he's become a symbol to many different groups. So for French Canadians, he was a symbol, even at the time of his execution when many of them were advocating for mercy, he's become a symbol I mean, to larger Canadians at the time of his execution, I mean, he had been demonized to such an incredible extent. If you read the newspaper coverage, he's like, um, you know, an insane demagogue. I mean, the language is so inflammatory. Um, and, we for, and, and then when his image was revitalized within Canadian artistic culture, it was very much as a tortured soul and as a martyr. And I remember, you know, when I used to teach the Métis history and culture classes and we would, you know, go to Winnipeg on our annual visit and we would talk about representations of Riel. One of the students said, and I apologize for the language, but with a little Métis bluntness here, it's like, how come they always have Riel with his arse hanging out? <laughs> Because if you think about these public monuments that were on the legislative grounds of Manitoba and Saskatchewan, he literally was, had his arse hanging out, he's like these, this tortured, semi-nude figure, um, you know, represented as this, as this tormented soul. And Métis people were really um, offended by that. And in Manitoba, like one of the you know, I have like new people who were really involved in this struggle to remove that statue. And it went right down to the final moment when someone was literally chained to the statue when they were hauling it away. You know, so it was contentious right to the moment. And one of the things that they wanted to do that the elders wanted to do in Manitoba was they wanted to work with the original artist. And they met with him and they told him how that image and that representation impacted them. And it was very emotional, but for you know, a number of reasons that artist did not fulfill the mandate to create then a different, it was almost like they were saying, nothing personal, you got it wrong, let's try again. But he did not complete that and they <laughs> hired somebody else. And so the statue that's currently up on the Manitoba legislative grounds, is a more realistic representation of Riel holding in one hand uh, the Manitoba Act. And when I traveled to Winnipeg with a bus full of SunTap students, um, I took them to see that statue. And they were so excited to see it, they all gathered around it and we took a group photograph and it was such a good moment because at the moment as I'm behind the camera, I realized because they were all working on their genealogies, of course, how many of them were direct descendants of Riel's provisional government. And it was almost like reenacting that famous photograph of Riel and the executive of the provisional government, because there were the descendants of, of those men, uh, you know, gathered around that statue. And I know that I would never ever have taken them to see any of the other statues. It, they would have had no meaning. I think we went and saw the one that's still outside St. Boniface College, but then it's like, what do you do with old monuments? <clears throat> Artists have represented Riel's and I sent um, members of the panel some examples of artwork that Métis artists have created. Um, David Garneau did one of my favorites, which is a version of the David portrait of Napoleon on a rearing horse, looking very heroic. Uh, I don't know that he did, wasn't much of a buffalo at <laughs> Riel, so that might've been more appropriate for Dumont. Edward Poitras has done a number of works because he's a descendant of Pierre Poitras, who was in the provisional government. And one of his most moving works is 2000 tons of rope. And it gives you an, an idea of what what moment we're commemorating today. And that is that entrepreneurs were selling what they were advertising as samples or you know, bits of the noose that hung Riel. They sold bits of the rope as souvenirs. And Edward calculated the volume of rope that was sold and it was 2000 tons. 
So in recreating that, he created 25 big spools of rope to represent the volume of rope that was sold, purported to be the noose that hung Riel. So how many people bought it? What was the desire to consume, you know, Riel's death? And so he confronts that by representing um, Riel's death, not with any images of him, but this room full of rope. Um, Jim Logan did a series <clears throat> that um, of hockey, using hockey as an analogy for uh, Canadian politics. And my favorite is called The Defenders. And it's two Native kids playing hockey, one with Riel and one with Dumont on the back of, of their, um, you know, of their uh, sweaters. One that I um, own, actually, I, I borrowed it to put in an exhibition at the Tosh in 2011 and loved it so much and couldn't bear to part with it. So I made monthly payments for a very long time to the artist. And that is Rosalie Favelle's I Awoke to Find My Spirit Had Returned. And that's referencing a quote uh, that's attributed to Riel, which I'm sure was not uttered as the nice tidy soundbite that we have today. But in the 1980s, this quote started circulating and it was, my people will sleep for a hundred years and when they awaken, it will be the artists who give them back their spirits. And a lot of contemporary Métis artists really took that on as a responsibility. And so Rosalie Favelle's <clears throat> image is a um, Photoshop photograph where she's underneath the Hudson's Bay blanket and it's basically a still from the Wizard of Oz. And she's Dorothy waking up and pushing the Hudson's Bay Company blanket away from her. And instead of the wizard peering in the window at her as it is uh, in the Wizard of Oz, it's Louis Riel. So it's a slightly, you know, tongue in cheek look at that quote. More recently, um, artist Jesse Short did a short film called Wake Up, in which she physically transforms herself with makeup into Louis Riel. And she really actually ends up looking like him. And this is all done silently. And then she looks out at the audience and says, wake up. But to me, maybe the one that has the most emotion um, is one of the last works created by Adeline Pelche de Reset, Machif from the Capel Valley, who did hooked rugs uh, with her daughter, Marg Harrison. And she hooked um, a Métis sash with the words, awaken my people. All of those works of art <coughs> are really compelling to Métis people and help us envision the kind of future that Riel stands for to us. Um, he, uh, just to pick up where Irma was leaving off, Riel's great niece um, passed away, gee, maybe four or five years ago. So she lived to be quite elderly and she was a very important uh, person in St. Boniface. And she was interviewed. And one of the things that she talked about was how much racism they experienced going to school and how their way of speaking, you know, how they were made fun of. And, you know, they spoke French, but it was Machu French. Um, <clears throat> and in her family, there was a tradition. So this is within the Riel family itself. There was a tradition of praying to Uncle Louis. So that in some respects for the family, Riel is a patron saint of education. That when children were experiencing racism at school, when children were getting ready, even you know, as university students, because there were a lot of Métis going to university in Manitoba in the early 20th century, late 19th century, when they would face real challenges um, during exam time, they would actually pray to Riel. So that in some respects for the family, he's, you know, he'd, he'd be something very, very different um, than what he has become uh, you know, for the rest of the country. I brought this in, I bought this at Osborne Village. I don't know if you can see it. 
So there's a, an awful lot of material that's been uh, created in Winnipeg as uh, souvenir items, making a play on real and real. So this one says the real deal. Other ones say keeping it real, but the makers and you know, wherever the profits go to has nothing to do with Riel or the Métis people. It's just this way that he's, you know, been incorporated into popular culture. So in some respects, like when I showed, I bought it and I brought it home, my mom said, well, I'm sure Louis Riel didn't want to end up on a tea towel. And I'm sure she's right. And I'm sure the family doesn't want to see his image, um, you know, on tea towels either. In terms of the flag, I was, I mean, I'm sure like many of you watching um, you know, images float by of people who've falsely claimed a Métis identity. And one of the things that I find really interesting is, and I think it, it actually affirms, if you will, the emptiness of the claim. Because it's like they have nothing to bring to the table. So they fly the infinity sign, which was actually first flown in Saskatchewan. It turned blue when they got to Manitoba. I don't know what happened, but it's described as red and it's documented as red, um, flown in Saskatchewan. By the time they, they approach Brandon, it's blue. But the other flags, um, the ones that were actually used by Riel and you know the, the men and women that followed him um, wasn't the infinity sign. The infinity sign comes from Cuthbert Grant, and that's very, that's a very specific history. And so I am, like many people, really disturbed when I see um, the infinity sign appropriated by groups outside of Western Canada, because it means nothing. It's just a shallow transfer or grafting of images. But a number of places can be guilty of reducing the Métis to these shallow symbols. You know, when you're looking at meaningful engagement of Métis people, slap a Red River cartwheel, a flag, and an infinity sign, and boom, that's Métis engagement. And so these symbols can, can trivialize even in, even in Western Canada. So that's a very long answer for your question. Thank you so much for that, Sherry. Um, as somebody who also comes from Manitoba, a lot of those stories um, populate the landscape of my childhood uh, and make me quite emotional to hear today. So thank you for sharing that. So turning back to Russell, um, who's gonna talk about Métis land and harvesting rights. Um, our question to you is, what do Métis harvesting rights mean to you? And in Canada, Aboriginal rights are always evolving in the eyes of the colonial government. What do Métis harvesting rights look like and how would you like them to evolve? Well, this will be a very short conversation, Emily. <laughs> Because the, the short answer is that we, uh, although we have Aboriginal rights that are confirmed through Section 35 in the Constitution and Supreme Court decisions such as the Pauli decision, which coincidentally was fought by uh, Louis Riel's great great grandniece, Jean Tayette, um, we actually don't have widespread harvesting rights in this country. And what, what most harvesters like myself find is that um, we are either asked to buy harvesting licenses or to continue to fight uh, the government, whether it be the province or the federal government, on a case-by-case -case basis. And so the onus is completely on Métis individuals to, um, you know, to bring those cases to, to the fore and to um, bring together their own financial resources to, to fight them. So um, there are limited harvesting rights for some specific Métis groups in the province. And so in Saskatchewan, if we think of the, the northwest side of the province, which is like the heart of Métis country in so many ways, communities such as Beauvel, Buffalo Narrows, Ila La Crosse, Laloche, um, th these are Métis communities. As Sherry said, we, we sort of have this, this narrative that all Métis people came from Red River and traveled west, but the community of Ila La Crosse actually precedes Red River by about 30 years. And so um, these are communities where Métis people have existed 
you know, for, for a couple hundred years. And so um, they have very specific territorial uh, harvesting rights in their areas, but not outside of those areas. All other Métis people, and the vast majority of Métis people in the province are urbanized, don't have harvesting rights, despite the fact, as I said, we do have jurisprudence which supports Métis harvesting rights. So just a, a little bit about myself, I'm, my people are from the Kapal Valley and I, I regularly fish in the Kapal Valley and have most of my life. Um, it's something that my ancestors did, it's something that all my uncles did and a lot of my aunties and it's something that many fans still do today. Uh, and yet every year I have to go and purchase a fishing license, um, which is ridiculous in so many ways because I'm not harvesting this fish to sell it, I'm harvesting this fish to eat it. Um, and the Bellamer case, which occurred in the, the late 1990s in Saskatchewan, was a case where a gentleman who, also from the Kapal Valley, actually has very similar family background to me. Um, he took the province to court and he actually won. Um, but unfortunately, the province said, you know, despite the fact that we've proven this gentleman has harvesting rights, we're going to make every single Métis person refight this case. And so, you know, almost... 25 years after that decision, Métis people still have to go to court to reaffirm their, their harvesting rights, despite the fact that we have Aboriginal rights guaranteed in the Constitution. The problem, as many of you are aware, uh, and First Nations people often share this problem with us, is that the Constitution didn't spell out what those rights are. However, we interpret Aboriginal inherent rights to be um, the rights that we always enjoyed as Indigenous peoples, the right to self-sustain ourselves, the right to, um, to self-govern ourselves, the right to travel through traditional territories where we have uh, systems of relationships that have been established through kinship and through friendship and through trade. Uh, so we assert as Métis people that all of those are our rights, it's just that we have to continually fight them in the courts, case after case after case. Um, so yeah, I promised you that was going to be a short conversation and that's that's essentially it, Emily. Um, there are pockets where Métis people have harvesting rights, but outside of those pockets, the vast majority of Métis people either have to purchase licenses or are fighting these cases case by case. Um, I know that uh, the Métis Nation of Saskatchewan is currently in negotiations with the province of Saskatchewan to get some sort of harvesting agreement in place. But it seems like we've been having these discussions for many, many years and, and um, we've, we've, we've seen nothing yet, but hopefully in the future, there will be an agreement that will allow families like mine to harvest in a way that they've been doing for hundreds of years. Well, thank you very much for that, Russ. And, um, you know, despite starting a little bit late due to technical difficulties, we've, we've mostly caught up. So uh, before we get to our audience Q&A, we're going to do a panel roundtable. So to our panelists who are going to discuss um, language rights, cu uh, cultural revitalization, what is the role of organizations in cultural knowledge preservation? And how is Métis-centered cultural knowledge experience, experiencing a renewal? And I'll let you decide who goes first. <laughs> Sherry's pointing her lips at me, so I guess I have to start. <laughs> which, is, which is okay, because I never like following Sherry. <laughs> Sherry's a hard act to follow, as you all have heard. But um, so... You know, three little letters, Emily, GDI. Um, Métis knowledge and Métis culture certainly does not exist within four walls of an institution, but there has been not a single organization in all of Canada, I would argue, although Louis Rail Institute comes close, I would argue in all of Canada, nobody has done more than the Gabriel Dumont Institute to gather Métis knowledge together, to preserve that knowledge, and then to disseminate that knowledge. Unlike First Nations or, or Inuit people, we, we don't have land base. There are Métis communities and there are Métis colonies, but they're very far spread out from each other. And so, um, you know, places that, that other Indigenous people can go to preserve that knowledge, which is usually a land base, we don't have that. And so we've had to find other ways to keep that knowledge and, and not to forget it. And, and Gabriel Dumont's Institute has been absolutely instrumental in, um, you know, 
conducting interviews for over 40 years now and making sure that those interviews are are transcribed and are, are housed in uh, our publishing department the the children's books that we publish the mitch of language conferences that gdi holds i should say with all full disclosure i'm an employee of gdi <laughs> <laughs> but I, I can also say that as a Métis person uh, who has been who's been urbanized for most of my life, and I, I come from a very strong Métis community uh, in the Valley, but I think as an urbanized individual, GDI and SunTEP really are some of the only places that Métis people can go to have their culture affirmed if they don't have that strong community connection. And okay, thank you. Why don't we turn over to Jessica? Um, I mean, probably because I'm a student, but I had basically the same thoughts as Russell did. Um, I was kind of thinking about this morning, like in terms of my generation, I find this like with myself and my peers, a lot of our parents came from the time where like, you know, I mean, like my mom was, was in SunTap, lots of my aunties, but they were part of the hidden generation. So even though they went through these programs, it wasn't really advisable to kind of celebrate it openly sometimes. Whereas now we we're in the new generation, like as millennials, where, you know, our feelings are most important. We're raised being like our, our, our feelings, our self identity is what is like most important in our lives. So now we come to these organizations because a lot of us do have that disconnect and it is, you know, GDI that kind of brings us back into the fold. Um, like, you know, I'm also an employee of GDI and I'm a student of GDI. So I'm also biased, but I also work for a Métis housing organization. And even, even there, just this, the involvement in organizations that kind of put a focus on Métis issue really kind of issues, I feel really has this resurgence or has contributed to the resurgence. Thank you, Jessica. And Sherry? I guess one of the things that I'm interested in is how, and this is not to contradict you, Jessica, at all. Um, it's really coming more from the East, this narrative of amnesia, families forgetting they were Métis altogether. I mean, that's different from when your performance of Métis culture gets split between public and private that who we are at our kitchen tables and who we are when we go out in the world is, you know, is tempered because of the level of racism that, you know, that one experiences. Um, what seems to have happened in a lot of places was that knowledge, well, and not just us as the First Nations as well, says disruption to <clears throat> transfer of knowledge. Um, probably the most vibrant example I have of that I hope Maria Campbell will forgive me for sharing this story, but I illustrated her book, Stories of the Road Allowance People. Whoops, my phone just rang. Uh, and one of those um, stories is um, a story of the Arcan, an old Arcan, the fiddle player who dies, has an out-of-body experience, goes, meets Jesus, kills a bottle of wine, gets a song passed down, wakes up, asks for his fiddle, and plays a tune. And then in practice, because it's a real tune, it's a real story. It's based on someone's actual experience. So the tune was played at funerals because the issue for many people was, you know, to be Indigenous was to be bad, was to be the devil. We were all going to hell. Kids in residential school had like the flaming, you know, pictures of hell and Indigenous bodies dropping into it, like at the foot of their bed, for God's sakes. And Métis people were, you know, fed the same kind of fear. So when people died, they were afraid. And so the story was told and the song was played. It's like, it's okay, don't worry. Jesus likes half-breeds. Heaven's not a bad place. They like fiddle music up there, you know. And when Maria first started sharing that story, she shared it on Bernelda Wheeler's Our Native Land. So she was sharing that story long before the book was published. And she got a phone call from fiddle players, a fiddle player from uh, Turtle Mountain on the other side of the American border. And it was an old fiddle player who knew the tune, but they'd forgotten the story. 
And then, you know, the elders Maria was talking to remembered the story, but they had lost the tune. And so I think that's the case in a lot that people have something, right? They have, they have something that's been passed down, but it's in, in some cases, part of it is missing. And so I think that's why GDI and other programs are so important because it gives us an opportunity to get into one place and everyone share their little bits of the story and find out how it connects. Like from an artistic point of view, <clears throat> the revitalization of beadwork that's happening right now among Métis artists is extraordinary, really extraordinary. And partly led by a painter, Christy Belcourt's celebration, you know, huge, you know, large scale paintings that celebrate um, Métis style beadwork. And a lot of us learned how to bead. I mean, I learned how to bead. I learned how to bead from Métis women <clears throat> who taught me. Um, the late Margaret Macaulay of Cumberland House and the late Mrs. Delarond of the Paw. I mean, I was, I was taught people had that knowledge to share, but I kept it separate. My artistic practice was over here. And then I would, you know, do this, I'd make moccasins and deep beadwork. I never saw them as being together. And there's just been an extraordinary flowering of Métis artists reclaiming beadwork and, and also embroidery. Um, and of course the dancing <clears throat> never faded. The dancing has, you know, always been uh, strong but is getting stronger. Thank you for that, Sherry. So we're gonna open up the talk to the audience for questions to our panelists. Um, and if you want to put those questions in the chat, um, I may miss your blue hand if you raise your hand. Emily, just before we do that, I just wanted to add there to the last question um, because I see Irma's name in, in right in front of me, and I don't want to I don't want to um, not mention our old ones uh, in terms of that last question. Our old ones carry a heavy, heavy burden today because they're being asked to do more and more because people. Uh, like me, uh, are, are asking them to teach us the language and, and to share some of their knowledge with us. And so I do want to recognize that our, our old ones are absolutely key to cultural and linguistic reclamation, um, that, that we do put heavy burdens on them. Um, you know, sometimes uh, non-Indigenous re researchers often will contact me for, for contact to my community. And I've been called a gatekeeper in the past. And actually, I'm, I feel complimented by that phrase because I do feel like uh, my community and my old ones do need to be gatekeeped to the certain extent that um, the knowledge that they have to share should be shared in a, in a way that is ethical and reciprocal. And I think too often they're they're approached in exploitative ways. So, so but I do want to just sort of mention, um, you know, to, to Irma and to all the old ones out there who are doing this work that is largely unpaid, that is largely absent of, of any sort of benefits or pension, that they're doing this work for the survival of our nation and our culture. And so uh, I just wanted to mention that. Thank you for that, Russ. And so while we wait for questions, um, Sherry, your uh, story around how um, uh, um, Maria Campbell had the the story for the song and then the fiddler knew the song or rather she she was talking to the elders and how that came together reminded me of um, uh, a few years ago I ran an Indigenous Research Summer Institute at the University of Regina and we had students from around the world that came as well as across Canada and um, as the students created relations and got to know each other and started to share their traditional knowledge, um, a story came out where three of them, one from Mexico, one a Sami student from Sweden, and one a Soto student from uh, George Gordon, were sitting, talking, sharing, and started to share a story, or rather a song from, from their, their childhood. And the beat was the same and the storyline was the same and they had this incredible moment of sort of connecting um on this pretty incredible level uh and i've just never forgotten that story because um you know i think it really reflects what can happen when we come together and and share our 
beautiful art and our knowledge. So are there any questions for our panel? And I see that Russ put something in the chat here. Is this the song? No, that's the story. That's the story. <laughs> there you go. Thank you for that. I think classrooms too. I mean, for me, the, the best teaching experiences, <clears throat> and I, it's not that I'm unwilling uh, to teach, um, you know, history and culture to a broader audience, but it's always such a much richer experience when the majority of your students are Indigenous. So the last time I taught Métis history and culture was in Manitoba, and I had two Riels in the classroom. I looked at my class list and I was like, nah. <laughs> but indeed, they were. They were uh, cousins and they were both descended from Riel's brothers. Mm -hmm. And there were, of course, other lots of other Métis students in the class as well. But <clears throat> when that happens, you know, part of what we do is we turn, I mean, if we're doing it right, we're turning our students' heads around and getting them to go home. Go home and ask, right? So it's not like you're the big authority and you know everything. It's just like getting them to turn around and go home. and. I had, I've had so many experiences over the years of what happens when students turn around and go home and ask their moms and their dads and their grandparents. And sometimes if the families are not wanting to talk because of the damage that racism has done to them, I would say, I'll play the mean teacher. Tell them you have to for a university class. <laughs> you know, it's like, it's, you know, kind of like that. But I've had extraordinary experiences. And in one case, um, a really young student, it was just this cheeky young skater dude who looked, you know, just with the hair hanging in his face and baggy pants. And <clears throat> and he, I read him as, as kind of disinterested just because of his demeanor, but I was wrong, right? That's the other thing. You can be wrong. You can underestimate your students. Anyways, he, he went and talked to his dad and his dad said, well, I guess it's time for you to go and talk to grandpa. So he went to talk to his grandfather and he was telling me about this after it all happened but he went to his grandpa's and there was his grandpa sitting at the dining room table with a suit and tie on right he had dressed up to share the stories with his grandson he had been waiting for his grandson to demonstrate interest and he had documents that he had to talk about and i had just the real blessing of being in the classroom a couple of days after that happened and seeing this young guy's face just lit up with this whole new awareness of who his family was and this whole new awareness of who his grandfather was you know because sometimes how helping people connect across that communication divide where often people with knowledge are waiting to be approached in the right way and kids are waiting for that knowledge to come to them Right. And so I think sometimes as a classroom in a classroom, you can facilitate those connections. And then that goes a long way to, you know, starting this reemergence because I have, and I'm sure Russell has had taught students who just kept going, like just kept going. And years later, you know, I'll bump into them somewhere and they'll have like stuff to tell me, which is awesome. So I think creating those safe places where we can tell and share our stories are really important. Mm. Absolutely. Yeah, I had to I had to put the title of that story, Sherry, because it's my favorite one from the <laughs> my my favorite line from that story is who am I to say no to that Jesus? <laughs> yeah, yeah. And you know the voice to say it in too, right? <laughs> Yeah, she really captures the voice. And what was interesting is that even with, um, you know, all of Maria's many accomplishments at the time, she had a difficult time finding a press that would publish it because it was written in the non-standard dialect of Machif and because she was really honoring the voices of the storytellers. And it really stands apart as like a key shift in Indigenous literature, like by, by breaking those rules and pushing that forward and honoring the voices 
of the storytellers and it affected the way that I illustrated it as well because <clears throat> I just did my best, first of all, because to honor those stories. And honestly, I painted them in the middle of the night sometimes because I was working full time. And I think you can tell when I was laughing, like, I mean, anyone looking at my studio window would have thought I was a lunatic because <laughs> when I did Good Dog Bob, I was killing myself laughing. And when I did Jacob, I cried, you know? So with each story, you could just, you feel it, the, you know, those storytellers I felt were just, they're a living presence when you really read that, that book carefully. So, the, I mean, that, you know, we have that combination of, creating spaces and then having materials that can start those conversations. So that's important as well. I read Good Dog Bob over the phone to my dad when he was dying of cancer. I always, you know, because it was hard for him to find anything to laugh about, but yeah, Good Dog Bob brought one of his last big chuckles. <laughs> That is um, a really beautiful story, Sherry. Thank you for sharing that. Um, 45 coming... people and we don't have a single question? Come yeah, on. we oh are coming God. up to the end of our time. <laughs> We've been on Zoom all year. Come on. <laughs> are there any questions from the audience? I think um, we, need, we need our own good chuckle after that um, beautiful story. So, Russ and Irma, I'm going to turn to you for a chuckle. Well, all we have to do is turn on Irma's mic and then we'll get lots of chuckles. <laughs> <laughs> this, isn't a, this isn't a funny story, but you, you asked about, about language and um, you know, I was at a, um, a language conference about six years ago, and the outgoing uh, official languages commissioner was there. And so his name was Graham Fraser. He's no longer the, the commissioner, by the way. But um, And so he was doing a plenary, and I, I thought I would get cheeky and ask the question <laughs> if he ever thought an Indigenous language would be an official language in, in this country, because, of course, uh, we know that the survival of, of French in this country has largely depended on legislative acts, which have protected it. And so we know that if those same acts were extended to Indigenous languages, that we can assume that they would have greater protections. And so I, I asked the question and I, I gave him, you know, sort of a little bit of background. I said, you know, we're not looking for all Indigenous languages to become official. I think that would probably be a little bit onerous. But I do think that we can look at certain languages like um, Cree, um, Ojibwe, and Michif, which are spoken across vast swaths of this country by tens of thousands of speakers and um, in many different territories. Um, and he looked me straight in the eye and said, no, that will never happen because it will be, it will be too onerous to have an Indigenous language. Everybody will fight that their languages should be official and we just don't have the resources for that. And so you know, that was that was only six years ago. And I think um, what that said to me as a language activist at the time is that saving this language, waking this language up, um, depends solely on us. Uh, that we can't really wait around for <laughs> acts of legislation and we can't wait around for resources. We have to get to do the work ourselves. And as Irma will tell you, um, there are very, very few Michif speakers left in this country. And so I just wanted to add that piece around language. And I think I ate up some time, so. <laughs> yeah. All right. Okay. Yes, we are at 345. Um, unfortunately, uh, and maybe next time it's just a more of a, a kitchen uh, conversation and visiting hour because these stories um, and the humor are really fantastic. Thank you, Sherry. Jessica and Russell for your time. Um, thank you, Irma, for the opening. I think she's gone. She wasn't able to stay till the end. Um, and also, again, um, 
a thank you to Natalie and um, Aaron for for helping me organize this today. It takes a lot to to coordinate all of these pieces, and it's very much appreciated that you all came out to help us acknowledge this important day and think about what it means to be Métis today. Thank you. Thanks for organizing it, Emily. Thank you.